Hello, my name is uh, Gergely Baroltigan, or easier just Greg, or uh, Gergely, or uh, whichever you prefer. <coughs> um, so I'm going to talk about to you today about uh, robotics in Go, and how it's a breeze, supposed to be. <laughs> so a little bit of history first. How did we, how did we get to here, to, to Go and robotics? So, a little bit, uh, a little bit about robotics. It's very complicated. <laughs> yeah, insanely complicated. A lot of math, engineering, and um, if you any, if you want to do anything uh, rather complex, then it's a, uh, it's a whole field that you need to understand. And, however, uh, as time progressed, it got a little bit better. Uh, support uh, got a little bit better, and now you can uh, you can assemble whole kits, uh, robotic kits, that will make you learn the whole thing a little bit easier. Like it's um, it's easier on your uh, part if you want to only deal with software development, for example. You don't you don't care about. Uh, Building the whole damn thing <laughs> out of <laughs> out of thin air, but you only inter you are only interested in the software parts of it. Then then you have nowadays the ability to do so by ordering kits and then assembling it and writing the code for it. So these all involved uh, a lot of microcontrollers and electrical engineering, and uh, you had to know about uh, uh, currents and how your servers behave and uh, when there is a um, uh, latency. Uh, then how to deal with that, uh, where to position your uh, uh, small tiny pieces of uh, resistance, uh, resistors, uh, resistance as well, <laughs> resistors to uh, mitigate these uh, power fluxes, right? Or else your um, microcontroller is toast. So all of these um, made people like uh, uh, revere it and and not not approach it the way uh, you approach other things like uh, web development or uh, or uh, even backend development. This is a whole complicated area of uh, of uh, engineering. So, for example, uh, the the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in NASA uh, built 2.5 million lines of customized C code. Uh, for the Mars uh, rover in order to put it into Mars, and that's like a lot of C, and even custom, it's, uh, it's supposed to be custom C, like uh, it's built for, uh, for space, hence NASA. <laughs> and, <coughs> but it's still cool, I mean, you can still learn it and still uh, 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 build some amazing things like the Mars rover. Mars rover. And also nowadays, uh, if you happen to not know about it, NASA came out with uh, "Build Your Own Rover," which is uh, a quite an interesting journey. They send you all the parts and all the um, all the manufacturing details of how to how to actually build a rover, and you have to put in the elbow grease, as they say. And uh, there's an open source library which uh, deals with uh, uh, building software for the rover, and it's supposed to be as mm, uh, dependable or as uh, as as strong as the Mars rover itself. It's pretty cool if you are into that and want to look it up, then you can. And this is the design of it that you can see. But this is still a lot of uh, a lot of elbow grease, a lot of uh, uh, C code, and a lot of potential to, to fail at some point, um, and, and uh, try to debug it and how, why, how and why it doesn't work, or why the, uh, the wheel doesn't turn. So the new way, <coughs> after a while, uh, uh, people started to notice that um, that people really, really like this stuff and really want to get into it and want to learn more. And so uh, Arduino and Raspberry Pi came along. And Arduino is a rapid proto prototyping platform, basically, but you can build some stuff, right? 
you still write some C, but it's not, it's not as daunting anymore as it, uh, as it used to be. I mean, with an Arduino board, you can uh, basically hook together uh, a couple of elements, a couple of, uh, uh, um, um, sorry, uh, sensors, a couple of sensors and build some very cool stuff, like uh, um, a LED that will tell you when you need to water your plants or uh, other, other things. <laughs> so, and with the Pi, and then the Pi came along and so who here has a Raspberry Pi running at home? Ah, there you go, nice. <laughs> That's a lot of people. I have three. <laughs> and um, uh, actually some of those are running Kubernetes pods. So it's pretty cool, but it came, it came a long way as in uh, it still supports uh, attaching sensors to it and at, uh, uh, attaching LEDs and whatnot, but the Pi, uh, sort of diverted into this small, affordable computer, but it can do so much more, and people do so much more with it, like uh, uh, send it into the upper atmosphere and then record some cool things. So how was this new? This was new because it was accessible, and it was uh, uh, cheap, and it was easy to learn and came with a lot of very nice documentation and examples and whatnot, and uh, you could just start picking it up and achieve things. Like, there was an immediate feedback to you as a, as a coder that I wrote something and I see it blink there and that's awesome. <coughs> Whereas in uh, robotics you probably build it for like two weeks, try it out, it crashes, and then you try again. <laughs> the software for you. So, and then along came OpenCV in the uh, uh, 2000 or something like that. It was uh, produced by Intel. Uh, yeah, it was first publicized in 2000. It was first built in uh, 19, uh, 1999. And OpenCV, who here knows OpenCV? Awesome, that's some hands. It's uh, basically, uh <coughs> basically uh, uh, processes images and uh, it, it does so much more. But uh, uh, also detect can uh, detect faces, objects, can does classification, and all sorts of cool things. And uh, uh, also, <coughs> also things like uh, uh, identifying a, a car by its plate, all sorts of cool. It's a uh, computer vision, basically. And then along came GoCV. So GoCV took OpenCV and like uh, later you will see, like uh, GoBot, it um, uh, added a convenient API before OpenCV. So nowadays with uh, Python, you can achieve some amazing things with like three lines of code or, or maybe, maybe four, maybe, maybe five if you want to like print out something. But, uh, you can achieve some amazing things by uh, leveraging the OpenCV's own API. So, but this is a Go conference, so I want to write Go, right? <laughs> so, along came Go CV, which lets you control OpenCV through a, a very nice um, and easy API, like uh, the deck face. And bam, does it. It's awesome. Or uh, follow that object or identify that, that object, like classify it, and it says, it's an apple. Well, it's an orange, but uh, well, close enough, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, still some CV involved with, uh, with Arduino and some Python with Raspberry. If you want to uh, uh, write Python with Raspberry, and usually uh, all of the libraries uh, uh, talking with the Raspberry's uh, uh, motherboard and sensors are in Python. So, we can do better. There's a thing called uh, TinyGo, which uh, uh, recently emerged, and it's by the same guy who, who does, uh, uh, or same people, who does uh, uh, GoCV and uh, GoBotIO. So TinyGo is for microcontrollers. So we all know that Go compiles down into massive binaries because it uh, compiles the standard library into it and does some linking, and so basically, if you can, basically you want 
a binary that is distributable everywhere and runs everywhere without dependencies, you will have a large binary. So, for example, a, uh, a thumbed hello world <coughs> compiles down to 1 and 5, 1.5 megabytes or 1.2 maybe. So, TinyGo took this to a whole new level. It's based on LLVM and can compile down binaries into 20 kilobytes or, or 30 or 50. So that's, that's awesome. And also it adds a lot of uh, capabilities, like you can burn, burn this, uh, uh, it adds you the capability or the facility to, to burn it directly onto a microcontroller. And it's pretty neat. Um, and you can write it in Go. But what if I told you that we can do even better? So the future of uh, robotics and IoT devices are APIs. Everything has an API nowadays. So if I, as a manufacturer of some kind of, uh, some kind of device or a robot or, or, uh, or a piece of um, technology, want people to use it, to leverage it, to build some cool stuff around it, then I will give you an API that can translate into the machine uh, for the, um, that I am translating for the machine to understand what the API does and what, what it can do. And you don't have to worry about the internals for that. So for example, a, uh, this drone in particular, the, the Tello, uh, comes with an API. It has a brain inside it. It has an Intel chip inside it that you can talk to. And the API handles all the, all the intricacies between uh, communicating with the drone and doing the stuff, and, and you telling the drone what you want. In order to leverage that API, however, uh, you still need to write some, some pretty messy uh, uh, byte transfer between the API and the host computer. So enter GoBot. So GoBot is a framework that does all this for you. It has support for over 35 or so uh, uh, platforms. So these are uh, including uh, Arduino, the Raspberry Pi, uh, the drones. It has uh, uh, DG, DGI drones uh, and and a bunch of uh, and a bunch of other uh, drones and devices that you can uh, use GoBot to talk to it. GoBot provides you a simple API to do so. If you are using GoBot and you can uh, connect to your device and GoBot supports your device, then you have a very simple API to use and talk to that robot. You have immediate feedback. You say, for example, take off, and it takes off. And GoBot translates all that stuff to drivers and events to that, uh, to that um, uh, device and takes, takes care of all of the uh, communications for you. So that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, some of, the, some of the platforms that it supports are uh, Board, uh, the Tello, and uh, um, yeah, the, the Intel uh, chipset, and yeah, you can see here. There's there's a lot of lot of stuff that it supports, and you can use it to play around with it. And of course, GoBot itself provides you with an API that you can use. Everything is an API. <coughs> Sorry, the API. Uh, so, for example, if you have a uh, uh, running machine somewhere that hosts a GoBot server and connects to like a couple of uh, other devices like an Arduino board or something, then you can control all of your Arduino boards uh, via this central GoBot server uh, via very uh, uh, easy uh, APIs. For example, you have an Arduino board that collects data uh, through weather. You have uh, an Arduino board that feeds your squirrel or something. Or, uh, or your lizard, because you have an automated ecosystem for a lizard. Uh, that's something I want to build. Uh, for a chameleon, for example. Um, 
it gets in information from the environment, like uh, heat and moisture and whatnot, and then based on that, uh, it reacts. It turns down the heat, it adds more moisture, it adds uh, 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 more water, it adds food, and so on and so forth. You can automate that with Gobot.io and, uh, and the server. And then you have the server, which basically um, monitors all that. Right, so you can, if you are not home, you can query the API and say, "Yeah, what's what's up? Is my lizard still alive?" And hopefully, it tells you yes. <laughs> and so then comes Tello, which is my uh, uh, current uh, uh, project, is basically a drone. Like I said, it has an Intel chip inside, so. Uh, it provides you with an API that you can use and that you can code some stuff to. So I'm going to use that. Oh, yeah, not the flying comments. So I'm going to show you some of the things, how it works. Um, let me show you some of its feature features. It's basically the, um, the drone provides you with an API that you can access once you connect it to the, to the Wi-Fi that the drone provides, uh, that, that the pro, uh, drone gives off. And once you connect it to the Wi-Fi, oh, that worked. <laughs> you can do some things like uh, let it fly. That worked. Supposed to land by now. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, after five seconds. Dude, you're supposed to land. Yeah, let's try that again. Ah, there you go. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right, so it's a bit wonky, but uh, still a lot of fun. So then, but this wouldn't be this wouldn't be enough if it would just fly, you know? That would be boring. So let's try a couple of tricks. Oh, Jesus! Stick command. Oh, I had that earlier. Hmm. Apparently, it's confusing the joystick somehow. Let's try it again. Come on, buddy. Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> so if you have multiple devices, then, uh, ah, you're right. All right. <laughs> then it could happen that, uh, that they collide. All right, that works. So, uh, can anyone see that? Let me, yeah. Oh, wait. Ah, there you go. So, this is achieved by basically this, right? So it connects to, it uh, gives you a new driver. The driver, uh, how it's constructed is, uh, it gives you, <coughs> uh, uh, you import the package that you, uh, you want to work with, like the, the Tello, and then you create a new driver, which uh, connects to the API of the Tello, and it uses underneath uh, drivers that are implemented that talk to the API of the Tello drone, <coughs> and uh, take care of all of that junk that, uh, that it has to, has to uh, send to it and, uh, and communicate with it. And then, Gobot gives you a very nice 
easy API to call. Land, fly, do my tricks, front flip, back flip, hover, and so on and so forth. There are a lot of things that you can do here. Go left, uh, palm land. Oh, that's a nice one. Actually, we can try that out. So after 19 seconds, say drone palm land instead of land. So that uh, the reason I'm shutting it off in between is that the Tello has a, a, a kind of bug where if it's too long in standby mode, it overheats. <laughs> So <laughs> I learned that through like looking at the code. I'm like, hmm, how can I fix this? And suddenly the tello goes uh, uh, with the red. Uh, it blinked red, and then it said, yeah, no, I'm not working. So it stopped working. I'm like, oh, what the hell? So then I, after some digging, uh, turns out it overheats after a while. Oh, sorry, I didn't connect to its Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi doesn't have a password, so please. <laughs> Don't! Because <laughs> I had to reset it too, too often. <laughs> All right, let's see. Come on, do the flip. Awesome. Now backwards. All oh, right. And now, ooh, cool. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I wasn't sure this was going to work, <laughs> but I'm very happy that it did. So then, <clears throat> so then what else can we do? There's still some stuff. Um, for example, if you noticed, the, the Tello has a camera in front. And make sure it works. And <coughs> the camera can be accessed through the API. Uh, how it does that is uh, basically stream the, the imi uh, stream the images one by one. And uh, uh, basically, GoBot takes that and converts it, and uh, we pass it on to FFmpeg and create a video out of it. So hopefully, I can show you that video streaming. Oops. Oops. I cannot type. All right. So again, turn it on. Connect to its Wi-Fi. Come on. There it is. And now if I run that. Come on. Where is my video? <coughs> <coughs> Maybe not that one. I remember fixing it. So, <laughs> <coughs> let's try that again. Come on. Where is my video? There it is. Ooh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I failed to fix the latency and it errors out. Uh, let's try that a different way. Because it's still it's still a bit finicky, so uh, and also you have to be aware that these are events, uh, they're controlled events, and uh, in order to protect the the the, uh, the data coming in and uh, also being able to like control it and do uh, and do the things you want with it, you have to be aware of the events and you have to be aware of uh, of making your code concurrent. So you launch a Go routine in which you are handling the flight data, and you launch another Go routine in which you are handling the 
uh, the controlling of the drone. And the controlling of the drone happens through channels. Uh, these all are taken care of uh, mm, of Gobot IO by the framework. So basically, you register events, you regi uh, register uh, receivers and listeners. It also provides you with the basics uh, of it that you can, but if you need a custom listener, like for example, something happens and you want the drone to react to that, then you can do that. So hopefully, For the love of, hang on. Um, the flight was a, the the flight. I mean, my flight was a bit a little bit rough on the equipment. So if we have a camera, and we have OpenCV with face detection, and we have all these nice events, then we can put all this together. And we can have a drone that, for example, follows a face or reacts to some other cool events that I'm going to hopefully be able to show you. Uh, and also joystick. Like uh, uh, this is a PS4 controller. You can uh, uh, basically hook up the drone to uh, work with the PS4 controller. So if we run this now, Thank you. Eighty four percent of the battery. And yes. So we can have some fun now. And you only need to use a controller for that and not their uh, proprietary software. <laughs> so, and we can try. Uh, should have a video. Oh yeah. Ooh, this is going to. Come on. I think the I think the controller didn't survive the trip. Is there another PS4 controller somewhere around here? <laughs> yeah. So, how do we make it land now? Well, don't do this at home. <laughs> uh, we need some kind of timeout, but, <laughs> but the problem is <laughs> that once it cannot connect, <laughs> like the API loses it, uh, it cannot send anything back to it anymore. So <clears throat> let, uh, let me try this again, because I swear it worked. Turn it on. Try this again. So, once we tell it to, for example, face track, right? Kind of uh, needs a background that doesn't isn't full of uh, clutter. Uh, there's my face. Oh no, where's my face? <laughs> Gives her a cool shot though.
No, skin sharing is gone. And now it's back because I plugged in the PS4 controller. Yep. All right. <laughs> so, as you can see, it still needs a bit of work. <laughs> but um, let's try one without, uh, without a controller. So, because it's OpenCV, um, uh, you have a lot of other options uh, to do, like, for example, uh, uh, gestures. You can um, you can calculate uh, how many fingers I'm holding up, for example. So, again, if the demo gods are with me, please just this once. And then we can go. Oh, the Wi-Fi. Right. So, so if I do this, hey, do it again. Ah, do it again. Nice. So, but if I'm holding one finger up. Two fingers. Three. Wait. Now. Ah, come on! See my fingers! So... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Stick everyone. Oh, for the love of... But it was working, you all saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, <coughs> Ooh, sorry. <coughs> so, I have one final thing which uh, doesn't involve a controller. But uh, still might be interesting. Uh, so, for example, you <coughs> all right, internal microphone, yes. So, for example, you don't want uh, you don't want to like control it with a with, uh, control it with a controller because it doesn't work. <laughs> like in my case, then you can uh, then you can, for example, use voice commands. Like uh, if you have a dictation and you have automation, you can say, "Computer, fly my drone," and it doesn't do anything. <coughs> Computer, fly my drone. Hey, but it didn't do it. <laughs> so, uh, you can see there that it did accept it and it saw that it runs, <laughs> that it would run it. And uh, you can create uh, an automation uh, binary with automator and uh, basically basically create a drone app that, uh, when you run it, runs, uh, runs a command like this and does the thing. And you see this address already in use. So it probably launched it, but uh, wasn't able to start, maybe.
So you can try. <laughs> yeah, right error. Yeah, I think the this thing really killed it. Anyhow, uh <laughs> um how you can do the uh, oh, yeah, you ha also have classification, uh, which I <laughs> unfortunately can't show because this broke. Um, basically, it takes, uh, it takes a, uh, a classification, as in a coffee, uh, coffee classification file, and uh, there are descriptions in the classification. And what it does is uh, taking those, uh, taking those um, uh, values and, uh, and classify objects that the drone that the camera uh, sees. So it could, for example, uh, uh, identify a bottle or a glass or a car or an apple or, or things like that. So one last time, let's try that. <laughs> Because that's really cool, because you can uh, hold up items to it, and it does tell you what you hold up. <laughs> Oops. Oh, what am I doing? Wi-Fi. Bam. And then... So you can see there's a <laughs> volcano there. <laughs> but planetarium, nice. But uh, for example, if I show it. Ah, the delay. Yeah, it doesn't. It's this thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. But this time, actually, I didn't, it <laughs> at least I didn't make it fly, so my hands are still working. <clears throat> so anyhow, you can achieve this uh, if you, for example, um, it's, really, it's really important how uh, fast the chipset is in the drone like uh, how fast can it transmit the, the frames, for example, because that's how accurate your phase detection will be if you do that. Like if, it's a, if it has a very powerful chip inside and it can stream the data very fastly, then you have much higher FPS and you can uh, have a much higher resolution and you can uh, uh, have a better, more accurate phase detection. And also, um, uh, it depends on the range of the Wi-Fi signal. You can have a repeater, for example, and then have a much larger uh, range where you can talk to the drone. And also, you obviously have, uh, uh, can have automated processes. What as I uh, started doing is uh, basically have a racetrack. Like, um, because it have object identification, you can have a racetrack where you identify uh, each and uh, each element uh, of the track saying that this is an obstacle you have to get around that this is uh, the finish line or I don't know this is a per person and uh, you need to try target it or uh, <laughs> whatever everything is possible <laughs> um, and you can and you can do that by actually writing uh, writing pretty cool go code instead of uh, instead of C and use the classifier and use all that. Like uh, you can see here that basically uh, I'm starting, uh, I'm loading in the models, the, the coffee model and the classification text and error handling is important. And then have a backend, uh, <coughs> sorry, this is the network. Uh, 
and then read the data. This is a FFmpeg, is getting the image data in a separate, uh, separate uh, process. And uh, we basically take that frame, create a matrix out of it, a matrix out of it, and then put it into analyze. And analyze all of what analyze does is uh, uh, get that blob from the image and uh, run it through GoCV and uh, um, do a, do a uh, matrix analyzation. And that's it. Puts out the text, bam, you're done. And how the, and how the gesture thing worked is basically do all the same. In the init, we initialize our, uh, our drone, we uh, 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 start the service, we start the video, and uh, basically take the image again and detect the gestures. The gesture detection is a bit, is a bit more involved. It, does, uh, it uses a Gaussian blur. Basically, it detects uh, uh, imperfections between, uh, in, not between, in, inside the matrix. And in fact, in imperfections are basically translated uh, as, as finger counts. So it's pretty cool. And uh, if the detection count, uh, it gives you the detection count, it does some, uh, does some math. And uh, basically, if, if there are uh, uh, larger than three fingers, uh, more than three fingers, it does a front flip. It's exactly three, it does a left flip. And if it's six, it lands. <laughs> so you can do it like this, if anybody wonders. <laughs> because it's just an imperfection, right? It will still count it. It doesn't do an anat anatomy. And yeah, basically that's it. <laughs> Throne flying with go.